Thus far, we've focused on the cubic unit cells. This slide and the next make the point that the unit cell need not be cubic. Unit cells can take other shapes. For example, rectangular prisms in the case of the tetragonal unit cell, parallelograms in the case of the monoclinic unit cell. There are a variety of different arrangements that unit cells can take in crystalline materials. And we don't necessarily need a six-sided unit cell. They can have, for example, different numbers of sides, as in the case of the hexagonal unit cell. So we won't go into these in detail. I only show the slide to make the point that unit cells can have a variety of shapes in three dimensions. They need not be cubic. If we think about a typical structure of an ionic solid, we've got a relatively large anion paired up with a relatively small cation. And a very typical situation for ionic compounds that are crystalline is that the larger anions often pack into a closest packed cubic crystal structure or hexagonal closest packing crystal structure, and the much smaller cations fill up the empty space in that closest packed lattice, essentially filling into holes. And whether the cation is very small or just a little bit smaller than the anion on the same order of radius, for example, dictates which type of hole the cation ends up in. Smaller cations tend to occupy what we call tetrahedral holes in the closest packed lattice. Tetrahedral holes are called as much because they look like around the empty space of the hole, which I've highlighted here in blue, the adjacent atoms take the appearance of a tetrahedron. And you can sort of see that here with one atom sitting on top and a triangle of atoms sitting below the hole. This resembles a tetrahedron. That's why the empty space is called a tetrahedral hole. And these are relatively small spaces, so relatively small cations, something like 20 to 40 percent of the size of the anion, occupy these holes. Larger cations cannot fit into the, into the tetrahedral holes and so occupy what are called octahedral holes. And the key with an octahedral hole is that it forms an octahedron-like shape around the hole. So an octahedral hole has a triangle of atoms above the hole and a triangle of atoms below the hole pointing in the opposite direction. This is a little bit difficult to see here, but we can see, for example, an example of an octahedral hole with the triangle pointing down right here and a triangle of, of purple atoms pointed up below it. That's an octahedral hole. One way to, to remember and, and visualize and think about octahedral holes is that the six atoms that surround the hole point along axes, we might say, point along x, y, and z axes that are at right angles to each other. If we connect all of these points together, the shape we would end up with is an octahedron, and this is reminiscent of the octahedral vesper geometry that we've seen previously. So octahedral holes are surrounded by atoms that form an octahedral lattice around the empty space, and they're relatively large, so larger cations can fit into those spaces. Ions that are of similar size, for example, cesium chloride, where the Cs plus cation is on the same order of size as the Cl minus anion, will often crystallize into a simple cubic lattice where the somewhat smaller, typically cation, is occupying a cubic hole, and actually the cations themselves form a completely separate simple cubic lattice. So we can here, see here, for example, that the anions are forming a simple cubic lattice, but the cations are as well, and those cations are nestled into a hole at the center of the simple cubic lattice. As an example of a structure where octahedral holes are filled, in something like Na plus Cl minus, the Na plus cation is much, much smaller than the Cl minus anion. The anions crystallize into a face-centered cubic lattice, and the cations occupy octahedral holes within that lattice. So it's difficult to see from the unit cell, but for example, if we pay attention to this diagram, the places where the cations are sitting have an octahedron of chloride anions around them. They're in an octahedral hole. An interesting example of a compound that contains atoms in tetrahedral holes is ZNS zinc 2 sulfide. In this compound, the zinc atoms form a face-centered cubic lattice, and the Zn2 plus ions occupy the tetrahedral holes, but only half of the tetrahedral holes. To see how and why that is, we'll look at the weird empty tetrahedral holes here in a second, but I first want to point out 
the tetrahedral holes that are filled. So one example is right here. Here's a Zn2 plus cation inside a tetrahedral hole. And what I've highlighted in red are the four sulfide anions that form a tetrahedron around the central zinc atom. Notice, however, that if we look for a corresponding zinc atom on the other side of the unit cell, somewhere around here, there's nothing there. Only half of the tetrahedral holes are filled. And if you do the math of working out how many tetrahedral holes we would expect within the unit cell, how many zinc atoms we would then expect within the unit cell, you'll realize that to achieve the formula ZNS, one zinc two plus for every one S two minus, only half of the tetrahedral holes can be filled with zinc two plus cations. Let's end by working a practice problem where we're dealing with a crystal structure containing cations that are occupying holes. Lithium chloride. In the lithium chloride structure, we have an FCC structure for the chloride anions, face-centered cubic, and the lithium plus cations are occupying holes within the structure. Our goal here is to use information about this crystal structure, specifically the edge length of the unit cell of the FCC lattice of the chloride anions to calculate the ionic radius of Cl minus. Now, we haven't been told whether the lithium plus ions are occupying tetrahedral or octahedral holes, so we may be scratching our heads a little bit as far as how to proceed. The thing to keep in mind, though, is that if the Cl minus ions are in contact with one another, which is stipulated in the problem, then we can almost think about Li plus as a kind of interstitial impurity in the FCC lattice of Cl minus anions. And so in drawing a picture of the unit cell and analyzing the chloride anions, we actually can omit the lithium ions entirely since they're not gonna have any impact on the dimensions of the unit cell. All we need to think about is a face-centered cubic lattice of chloride anions. And that's what I've done here. So we've got the face-centered lattice, we've got the chloride anions drawn on that front face, we know they touch along the face diagonal, and we know that there are four radii across that face diagonal. So L is equal to the edge length times the square root of two. From this, knowing the edge length, 0.514 nanometers, and this relationship, we can calculate the atomic radius, or ionic radius, I should say, of chloride, and that is 0.182 nanometers, or 182 picometers. And that's it. So this problem was a little bit tricky. We actually didn't need to consider the lithium plus ions at all. But I like this problem because it makes the point that small cations that fit into holes in the cubic lattices can often be ignored if we're only interested in, for example, the dimensions of the anions. They act like interstitial impurities. Recall that we saw way back in the discussion of vacancies that impurities can get into crystal structures in locations between the atoms within the lattice. And these small interstitial impurities don't really disrupt the lattice. This last practice problem is a great example of that phenomenon in action.